David, we are extremely casual. Um, by the end Pretty of this conversation. By the end of the I'm conversation. Wearing a, I'm, wearing a, I'm wearing a collared shirt. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I got my favorite coffee mug. I love this coffee mug. Why? Oh, I hate mug. That is. What is I, I can't tell what it is. Well, it's oh. a naked man, presumably a Brazilian man, because it says coffees of Brazil, with a basket of coffee beans. <laughs> and I've had this mug for decades. And I should not give it the evil eye because I have put, you know, put the handle back on. Um, <laughs> it's, it's beautifully broken. I like that you you mended it. That that's actually uh, that's really uh, important. Yeah, that yes. makes it even more important. David, are you drinking out of an upside down Devo hat? Um, it could be from the '80s video, but no, I think this is sort of the best amalgamation. It's halfway between what Carmen's mug was and your mug, and so uh, oh, I, I yeah, that, but it's right. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we have with us here today on Pandas, David Bray, Dr. David Bray. And I have to, before I forget, and before we even introduce you, I have to give the caveat or disclaimer or whatever, that David and I work together in a in a situation where we're making money in the same project. And so I think that could be something important to say. Yes. And so, right. we, uh, so, but hopefully we're one, I don't think we're diving into it. If we will, we will disclose to the group that we're, that's what we're working on. But otherwise, um, we knew each other before we were on a project working together and most recently have gotten on a project. But I think that is good to disclose so that folks know. Uh, now, when did you meet David, yeah. Julia, or, or vice versa? I was introduced to David uh, via my friend Francisco Molinero. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, of course. And that was last fall, like December, maybe? January? Correct. Yeah. yeah, he brought yeah. you, you joined the Vanguards. It was, you joined the Vanguards last year. Yes, exactly. And yeah, so, yeah. Do you want to say what, actually, why don't you introduce yourself and say what the Vanguards are? Because the name I find hilarious. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so my name is David Bray. The PhD just meant I was persistent, politely persistent, maybe. Um, and uh, uh, it's great to be here with both of you because I've known Carmen for more than a decade. I think we connected on the future of work back in the early 2010s. Uh, when she was looking at the future of work and what it meant for public service. Um, in terms of my own background, I just say I've been fortunate enough to be at the intersection of technologies that were only available to the more exquisite parts of our government, what it meant when those technologies were becoming commercially available, and what it meant for civil societies, national security, and just coexistence on the planet. Um, and then the vanguards, uh, the question about what are vanguards. Um, so generally, we have the rule of non-attribution, non-partisan, non-absolutist. It's a safe space to come together to talk about these issues that sort of evolved because when I came back from Afghanistan in 2009, um, I was left scratching my head because uh, I was wondering why were we still in Afghanistan? Um, it didn't make sense to me. I had been asked to sort of identify problems and possible solutions. And I said, we kind of need to exit because literacy is only 20%. And if we somehow think we're bringing democracy in the next one or two years, good luck. It's probably more 30, 40, or 50 years. And so I just needed a space where I could get other viewpoints and other perspectives, because if you don't, then you, you may miss something. And so initially it was in-person meetings at least once a month, all the way up until COVID happened. So we got past a decade of these meetings in DC and then we went virtual. And now it's a, just a very lively series of signal chats um, because that's, that, that's actually how I, one, get a more 360 view beyond just my own perspectives is listening and, and, and being attentive to the perspectives of others. Yeah, and actually it really has become that. Like I go there when something, when some event happens, like this recent uh, helicopter crash, right? So I'll go there and see what they're saying. And you got Republicans, you got Democrats, you got people who wouldn't even call themselves either. You got people from outside the country. It's um, it's actually pretty interesting. And they coexist. I mean, to me, yes. it, is, it is the best sign that if you remove the theater of signaling, because I think nowadays, in some respects, it's a repeat of the 1890s. Uh, you know, I tell people, you know, the 1890s, there was the rise of rapid technological progress, mega corporations of a sort, um, individuals that were waiting in the politics from the private sector and things like that. And the Congress was slightly more polarized than it was now. And also that's how, you know, Pulitzer and Hearst were making their money was with sensationalism, with headlines that did not necessarily match the news articles. And so we've kind of, we're kind of like in the second Gilded Age, we're kind of repeating the patterns of 1890s. Now, of course, how the 1890s and 1900s ended was World War I, Great Depression, World War II, and I'd like to avoid that. Um, but it's interesting that when you remove the theater of signaling, 
people actually can coexist even if they belong to different perceived tribes. How do you remove that? I mean, so okay. Not I mean, not attribution, but also within the theater. I mean, we are all in, in a sense, in any, so I mean, this might be something to delve into because in any online group, right? And maybe even especially when you don't have your body language to signal, and especially when you have pseudo anonymity, um, then there's other ways that signaling happens, right? Sure. And it's, and, 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 Sure, there's not attribution, but there's also major like well, I got there first, da, 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 all that bullshit, and it's irritating. Yeah, ego. And, <laughs> yeah, right. And so, I mean, how? And so, have we gotten there? And um, can we get there? Well, and maybe we'll pull in Carmen in this because you know when when you work inside the intelligence community, you you, you everyone's got a healthy ego but you kind of need to put your ego aside if it's really about the mission. And so it's about how do you frame things to be more of a mission context that it's about the good of the group as opposed to it's about self. Um, but maybe Carmen has thoughts. Mm, I, don't, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean- It's a hard question. It's a hard question. And I mean, I, I, I can say something self-serving which I, I kind of think is true about me, which is that I I don't lead with ego a lot. I mean, believe me, I have ego, uh, but it's, I- It's true. I had experiences in my very early adulthood that were quite uh, defining in terms of how I thought about how I conduct myself and my ego. And- um, and so, and that's, that stuck with me forever. I remember once uh, after these experiences where I, I don't, shouldn't be talking about myself, but. Well, wait, the, can you share one of the experiences? Yeah, I'm to... just going to tell you. Yeah. So uh, I, I dropped out of Texas Tech and I actually believe everyone should drop out of school at least once because it's, yes, it, it's kind of resets you a little bit. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the women in my dorm uh, as I was leaving that last night said, you know, Carmen, we, we used to think you were an asshole, but now we've gotten to know you a little better the last couple of days. And, and we realize you're not an asshole at all. And I was like, okay. I mean, I, I, it was fine that they said that, but that led to a lot of reflection. And so I had been a college debater and I, and a very good one. And, uh, I was used to scoring points and beating people up with my arguments. And uh, through the process of several weeks of kind of figuring it out and reflecting on it, I realized um, that I didn't want to do that anymore or I didn't want to do it anywhere near as often. So I just stopped. And uh, I remember by the time I got to Catholic University here in the district where I got my degree, I was still in the, I never raise my hand. I'm very quiet. I don't say anything. So there was a midterm and the professor gave me my uh, test back, which was an A. And he said, I couldn't figure out who you were. I couldn't figure out how I did not know the student who had gotten one of the top grades in the class. And I went, oh, okay. So therefore, I, I, you know, again, talking about myself, but that was the experience. That's how it all played out. And even uh, in the work environment uh, where I, I, I tend to be, my, I believe my best role in a work environment is as the synthesizer. Everybody talks. And then at some point, toward the last third of the conversation, I go, well, you know, this is what I've heard. And maybe these are the ways we can put all these things together so they fit. Mm -hmm. but, but Carmen, question. Yeah. So I think it's totally fine to talk about yourself, <laughs> especially when you're trying to communicate this way of being. But I think also what you're saying without saying it, and I'm going to check me if I'm wrong, is that by modeling this, so as a leader, by modeling this, it also supports without direction or without explicit rules it supports that in the people you're leading correct 
Yes, that's right. And, you know, I, as I became, again, I don't know why I'm talking about myself. This is David's panda. Oh, no, uh, but, but I, we all talk all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a conversation. It's pandas. Yeah. yeah, we're all pandas. But yes, I, I, you know, at the beginning, my first, when I was my first management jobs, my first uh, conscious uh, sort of decisions was I'm just going to be myself. I can't pretend to be, a, you know, the the stereotype of a manager in the intelligence community, stere, you know, serious gravitas, blah, 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 blah. I, I can't do that. I tried it for two weeks. I was miserable. So I just said, I am just me. And then uh, as I had more experience and had, you know, more responsibilities, I realized, oh, this being me allows other people to be to be them. And yeah. and I think that's a positive. Yes. And I think if I could build on what you were saying, Carmen, because I think, you know, this 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 may also build on what Carmen said and answer your question, Julia. Authentic leadership has to be a team sport. You know, we have this myth of the sing singular authentic leader that somehow did something by themselves. And I would submit that anyone who tries to be an authentic leader in an environment in which they are the only one will either metaphorically or actually die. Um, and history, sadly, is replete with examples. And so what you have to do is find a way to make it a team sport where everybody feels comfortable being authentic. That includes disagreeing and includes, you know, not always getting along, but that's okay as long as people realize that authentic leadership is a team sport. And that's easier to do initially in a big tent that is a safe tent, as opposed to trying to do it on, dare say, social media or, or you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's difficult to do that because then people start having other conflicts aside from just being authentic. And then so you David, sort of ask, do you need leadership yeah. in that sense? And that's it. <laughs> so you, you, use two, you use two words that I avoid saying at all costs, hmm. authentic and leadership. Hmm. I, I, I have grown to hate the word leadership. Tell me more. Even and how, when you say how, that you've grown to hate it, you're actually flipping off the camera. Whoa. <laughs> and that, that clearly was Freudian, right? Yeah. <laughs> I have, I have grown to hate it. Uh, I, uh, it, you know, the thought really came, well, many, many, I had many small experiences that fed into this. But when I was in Deloitte, we had a, uh, I had a colleague who's young, you know, inexperienced and used the word leadership like every other sentence. So he was on the, he was on the leadership team, which he always made sure you knew that yeah. he was on the leadership team. And if somebody would say, like one of the people that worked for us uh, would, would ask a question, you know, can I do this? He would always say, well, I have to take it up with the leadership team. And I'd be sitting there going, can you please just stop saying that? Can you talk like a normal person? <laughs> Can you just even say, instead of leadership team, just say, let me talk to Carmen and Shrupti about it. That's way better <laughs> than the word <laughs> leadership if team. If so I, if I that, say, yeah. that mean, just sealed it for me. No more leadership team. Well, and what I think is one of those words that at the moment you say it, yep. it implodes. Well, it, it, you can and not use that word. Well, so I hear yours per second. I would say in that case, actually, it was management disguised as leadership, which I actually say a lot of people confuse. When I when I talk to folks, I say, how many of you want to be leaders? And of course, usually in a crowd like that, especially with young folks, they all say they want to be leaders. And I say, what if I told you that the root of the leader of the word leadership comes from the Greek word lead, which means to be sent unto death? How many of you still want to be leaders? Oh, and that's when they sort of have that. a moment. That's very useful. Um, and I tell people that there's management and leadership. And if you're getting awards or if it's somehow like, you you know, in that case where you're saying, I got to take up with the leadership team, he really meant the management team, not the leadership team. Because if you have to, you know, if you're saying we've got to get permission and we've got to follow things, that's management. And what I tell people is the reason why Greeks associated leadership with being sent unto death was because back in ancient Greece, the flag bearers, the elites, were the ones that carried a flag in front of the army. And the first to die when one melee army comes in contact with another melee army are the flag bearers. And so it's really about how do you manage stepping outside of expectations? How do you try to bring along folks for that journey 
recognizing that you may die because you stepped too far out of expectations or you just didn't get buy-in. But I agree. I think right now a lot of people a lot of people give out leadership awards or leadership recognitions when they really mean the word management. And some of them mean the word rebel, right? Some of them actually are for people who are doing innovative things, but um 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 oh I'm I'm thinking about the cover of a uh, Gers. Hold on. Yep, yep, yep. Hold We're going to see where Julia's going. The camera's moving. <laughs> yep, camera's anyway, moving. Here we go. Uh, I wasn't going very far. I didn't want to actually leave the couch. But um, the Intelligence of Intuition, Gerd Gigan, Gigarenzer. That's his new book, right? That's his new book. Have you read it? Not yet. No, okay. I just, I'm just, I'm in love with it already. All right. Yep. Yeah. Um, I haven't read it yet, though. It's sitting on my table. I'll read it this week. But you see that little plane going? I can't trace it with my finger because it's backwards. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. The yeah. guy going, exactly. the little plane going the other way. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that is the kind of leadership that you might call like, um, sign I want to almost want to call it like when you talked about the flags, like signaling, like signaling to a school of fish, like we're going to turn here. And um, that first fish is in trouble, usually, right? Because they're alone and they're not with their school. But it's a really important uh, job, but it just doesn't usually, it's not sustained. And so that's why, in other words, we all, we all take turns being that fish, right? And that fish gets eaten and then someone else comes and does it. Or, or, you right. know. And so that's why we're all on the leadership team. So in a certain sense, and then there are times when you have to be a follower. So I just kind of like... So I think it's just crazy. I just think it's crazy and inaccurate to think that someone sustainably is always a leader or always a follower. I just think that we have to completely restructure. I just think we have to completely restructure the way we do organizations. I just think that. I well, think that too. I think yeah. that too. I, I think that's that why we're all here because we've all 15 thought years that. or so. Yeah, yeah, that's how so, oh, Carmen and I initially bonded was over similar thoughts, especially in a public service setting. Yes. Well, exactly. So what would it be like if, you know, on one project, you're like, oh, on this project, I really feel like being the outspoken person who's, you know, having some interesting ideas. And on that project, I really feel like being the person who someone says, hey, would you do this? And I go, yeah, sure. But I don't have any thoughts about what would be better. You know, I don't know. Is that a thing that could happen? Or do people so, have to stay in roles and hierarchies or else we won't survive? Or is that just patriarchy? I don't know. So so a couple of things is, let me first make it sort of concrete for folks so that we can ground it and then build up. Um, so back in 2000, I parachuted into a role with the Bioterrorism Preparedness Response Program at the CDC. We were only 30 people. Um, I was the one person that knew IT and biology. And every six months, Congress said, we're not sure you still need to exist and would cut our funding. And if you remember in February of 2001, the Agile Manifesto came out, the idea of Agile development. And I was an early adopter of Agile development, but I was being told, get back into waterfall development, follow the five-year plan, the three-year budgeting cycle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And literally that summer, uh, I was getting in trouble, but I was saying back in response, I was like, we don't have a deal with the terrorists not to strike until we have our IT systems online, um, which you know, in 2001, early 2001 seemed kind of you know, like, what are you talking about? You know, this, is this necessary? And so it was actually scheduled weeks in advance for me to give a briefing to the FBI and the CIA, the Interagency Intelligence Committee on Terrorism, as to what we would do if a biotech event happened. That briefing was scheduled for September 11th, 2001 at nine o'clock in the morning. And so, of course, 834, the world changes. We literally pile computers in the cars. We set up an underground bunker, fly people to New York and D.C., deal with the response to 9-11, send down from Heiler on October 1st after not sleeping for three weeks. October 3rd is when I flew up and briefed the CIA. And then the first case of anthrax shows up 24 hours later. And then it was more, why haven't you done more? How come, how come we don't have more capabilities online? And so, you know, in some respects, this gets to the question of, you know, the challenge of being a leader in the time that you are truly being a leader, not just a manager, but truly being a leader. How do you check yourself to make sure you're not the crazy one? How do you check yourself to make sure you are not deceiving yourself and thinking something is necessary? What's the evidence or the data or the sounding boards that that separate someone who is truly crazy versus doing the right thing? And sometimes it's all in how history unfolds. Well, that's really interesting because it it, it makes me think that like this this person who's 
you know, flying that plane to go over there yep. is that we only call them a leader or a signaler if that is in fact the, you know, if that's verified as the direction to go. If right? the environment proves your case, which right. we don't always know what the environment, we, we don't always have perfect fidelity as to what's going on in the environment. Um, well, right. And it's a time frame thing, right? So, so because of human thinking, which I'm not going to say is wrong because it's how we evolved, but it, it it's certainly incorrectly evolved for the situation we have, are in now, but that, but the human uh, time frame demands clarity that that was the right direction within like weeks yeah, rather than years. Correct. But on the other hand, I mean, I think your story is very interesting because on the other hand, because I think about time differently, it also feels like the universe could be said to have been preparing you for a different time frame since 2000, right? Reaching back in time and saying, sure, people are going to think this is unnecessary, but you know, we're going to do this thing, right? And what do you and think about my that? My life seems feel? to be, is, unfortunately, I'm ahead of the curve and the art of it was, so uh, I'll give another example um, and, and apologies if anyone's going to enroll in the Harvard Kennedy School's leadership course, but I will give you a preview of their first session. And they do a really great job. It's situational learning. And I've had the opportunity to serve as an executive coach where they get everybody together. Initially, there's some nice socializing and then they go into the classroom. And it's a classic classroom setup. The professor, she or he sets up and they ask just one question, what is leadership? And then of course, you know, everybody starts volunteering answers and the professor just writes the answers that they give on the board and says nothing else. And that goes on for about five or six or seven minutes. And the anxiety levels start to get up because the professor hasn't said anything. <laughs> keep on writing what everyone says on the board. At a certain point in time, usually around 10 or nine minutes in, someone says, are you listening to us? And the professor writes that on the board. Are you going to answer any of our questions? The professor writes that on the board. I love it. And so, it, you know, anxiety levels are now going through the roof because they're like, what's going on here? And usually at about the 10 or 12 minute mark, somebody will say, well, maybe we're supposed to teach ourselves which the professor writes on the board. And you can almost guarantee, this is a group of about 50 to 60 people. The group starts saying, no, you know, this is Harvard. We paid a lot to be here, you know? And so meanwhile, the professor is just writing whatever and and they gang up on that person that said, maybe we're supposed to teach ourselves and they shut that person down. And, you know, the professor keeps on writing on the board. And usually about then after the shutting down moment happens, the professor turns and says, that's our class for today. See you tomorrow. And walks out. Oh, <laughs> and you can good. imagine this is in the you know this is the first day and everyone's walking back because because you're staying in the dorms and everyone's feeling a little bit of stress the next morning the professor shows up and again says so what happened you know again simple question and someone volunteers and says well you weren't teaching us and the professor says were you you know was i not teaching you what were your expectations and somebody will say well i was expecting you to do the fine thing it's like did i sign up for those expectations did we reach agreement and you know, that, then you sort of explore that there were expectations that the class had put on that person that that person had not signaled that they were buying into. And so they were doing something different. The professor then after about 30 minutes says, okay, and what happened when this person over here suggested you needed to teach each other? What happened? And it's exploring how the group ganged up and shut that person down. And even more so, then it's a question of what could have that person done differently to convince people that maybe they were supposed to, that that was an attempt at leadership, but it was shut down by the group. And what could have that person done differently? And so I often say it's the strategy for managing the friction when you step outside of expectations. Uh, and how do you actually manage that friction? Because yes, people are going to try and shoot you down. And we're really good at anyone who steps outside of the status quo, metaphorically or physically shooting at them. So what is the strategy oh. for managing expectations? Are you saying leadership is the strategy? No, you're not, you're not saying that. No, no. That's but leadership too... is the is is when you're doing it. You're, so I believe in adaptive leadership. You have to you, you have to try all different tools in the toolkit. But there is you know you have to sort of go to the balcony and say what's really happening on the dance floor. Why is why are people you know what are the incentives or disincentives that are motivating them? Why are they sort of falling into old behaviors? And then what is your you know because I come from public health. What is the intervention you need to do? Or, or orchestrate and run it as an experiment. And if it doesn't work, pivot and pivot. But it's the idea that, you know, generally people want to do things that are that make them heroes in their own minds. And so if you think they're doing something that's not what's needed for the situation, how do you put in place the incentives or the values or the trust relationships to steer the ship in a different direction? 
Mm-hmm. Well, you know, David, you and I have, I think, very different approaches. I'm to, sure. To and that's okay. Thing that you that you start with the letter L. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the other I, L word. What, yeah, <laughs> one of the concepts that made a huge influence on me, oh, maybe 15, 20 years ago when I heard it, was the concept of discretionary energy, mm-hmm. which is this idea. Uh, I probably have mentioned this to you, Julia, but it's just the idea that to really have excellence on a mission in a team as an individual in a family whatever you <clears throat> the actor here that we're talking about has to be motivated to provide that mission family team whatever their discretionary energy mm-hmm. that energy itch usually represents like you know scotty giving she's giving you all she's got captain That's that level of energy. And the great irony, paradox, I never can use any of those words correctly, uh, of the L word is that there's no way that the L person can invoke or force somebody to give you their discretionary energy. It's a mystery, but it's, it's all about being in an environment that you feel psychologically safe in, are comfortable in, are are in flow in right and so to me that means that you know in in a in an inaccurate way i i kind of believe in just being with the people that i'm working with being just being alongside them and then doing everything i can to be kind. Mm-hmm. That's that I think creates, you know, helps facilitate that environment where the discretionary energy emerges. But that that's that's all I that's really all I believe in. So any 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 active verbs about how you're going to manage or you're gonna select or you're gonna, you know, direct or whatever. I just I just have real problems with them. Oh, see, I have a, I have a I have a framework for both of you. Unifying theory? I have a unified okay. theory of leadership or the L word as we like to call it, love. Yeah. So yeah. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The other L word, uh, too, as David said. Um you have both of those kinds of leadership and they're both valuable for different kinds of people in a different situations. And so in that Harvard classroom the kind of leader that I have aspired to be is the one who's at the board, the teacher, who's being completely quiet and invisible as a leader, but completely shaping the mood of the place and and, and, and totally listening because he has to write everything on the board, right? This is like the wise elder leader model. And then there's the young like whippersnapper leader model of like, well, what can we do? Well, let's make this better. Like, it's the maximizer model uh, in the in the Clifton strengths. Um, what can we do to make things better? Let's make it better. And and learning how to do that that's also really valuable. This so it's almost yin and yang. It's almost um, feminine receptive, masculine go get them. You need them both, and in different situations and with different people and at different times. And so, bravo to you both. I think you're, I think you're doing it. I think, I think you're doing it appropriately. And David, you, people are attracted to you as a leader who are in those situations and times when they need the like, you know, whippersnapper go, bias go. towards action. Yeah. yeah. Bias towards action. And people are attracted to Carmen when they're like, they want to be developed like yeasty bread. And, um, Ooh. <laughs> like that. and it smells well, great. <laughs> and, and if I could give it, I mean, I, I liked what Carmen was saying. I really liked it, actually, because one of the things I believe is one of the best thing leaders can help foster and create. And I'm going to use the words foster and create, and hopefully that's not too much of an action verb, but <laughs> our safe spaces. And 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 so I'll give another example. Um, so Stephanie O'Sullivan, who was the principal deputy director of national intelligence and one of the best bosses I worked for, um, after I had done some work in the IC, said, we need some help at the FCC because uh, they'd had uh, two advanced persistent threats that had happened in the early 2010s, and they needed some remediation of it. She said, would you be willing to go over there? It's it's IC adjacent and try and help out. Now, 
I said yes, and then later I realized that there had been nine COs in eight years, which is always a great sign for CO number 10, but that just shows that she was a good CIA handler and that she didn't quite disclose that there had been lots of deaths before you arrived. Um, and I showed up there, and and again, I was trying to piece together, one, why there had been such massive turnover, and two, I could sense that people were fatigued. There was change fatigue even prior to my arrival. And so um, I, I started doing meetings, all hands meetings, where I could only ask questions for the hour. I couldn't impose my own views. And so I, I started off, this was about two weeks in, I said, how do people feel like we're, you know, how do people feel like we're doing? Are people excited? And, and I could tell people were initially shy. So I called on some people that I knew were extroverts and they started volunteering. And, and towards the one hour conversation, people started sharing their different perspectives about how things were. And I even jokingly said, how many of you are just waiting to see if I'm still here six months from now? And more than half the room raised their hands. <laughs> um, and that was honest. And, and then I said, and how many of you um, wish that we could go back to the way IT was done in the 80s and the 90s? And that was actually about one third. And then we were about to wrap up when someone in the back of the room said, I got a beef. And I said, could you please tell me more? It happened 17 years ago. Could you tell me more? And it was some issue where there was some dispute between contractors and government that had happened 17 years ago. Now, I'm only two weeks into the job. But I say, I appreciate you sharing that. How can we take those lessons learned from then and apply it to what we do now? And so I think sort of building on what Carmen's saying and maybe serving as a bridge is it is creating that safe space where people can bring the stone soup that we're making together. But also, how do you take what might be problem admirers or problem holders and find the space, as you were talking about, the energy to, to encourage people on their own to intrinsically want to be problem solvers as opposed to you giving them the solution. And so I, I really like what Carmen was saying. And I think that is that is key. I talk about a congregation because my father was a Methodist minister, but you know, how do you the oh, congregation Oh, that explains something. A hundred percent. What does it explain? Indeed. What does it explain? I recognize I became my dad. My dad's skill sets were healing fragmented congregations and capital planning. I parachute in and he also my mom was Catholic before she agreed to marry my dad. So I saw what that meant to give up her faith to, oh, wow. to become Methodist. I also saw that my dad, when I was in elementary school, got assigned to a church that was jointly Methodist, Presbyterian, and Episcopalian at the same time. So he was card carrying of all faiths for a while. So when people say, like, how can you be a nonpartisan? I'm like, kind of grew up that way. And that, you know, people at the end of the day generally mean well if you if you get down to what do they truly believe, it's just differences in how they worship. Oh, interesting. So you see it uh, politics as religion? No, no, no. Well, <laughs> one, I don't do I don't do big P politics, but I think at the end of the day, you know, I you know, people say non, you know, nowadays nonpartisan seems to be a dirty word, and I'm like, no, no, no. Nonpartisan does not mean you don't have values. It doesn't mean you're neutral. It means you swore no, in my opinion, to the Constitution. And as long as you're good with the Constitution, we're great. Um, but it's it's a loyalty to the Constitution first, as opposed to a party first. And so what I realize is that when you get down to brass tacks as to what people value and what they hold true make it more what are the actual values they hold as opposed to the moniker of I'm part of team A or team B. Carmen, what did you mean by um, Methodism explains everything? Or did you mean? No, a, a minister, minister's minister. children are, uh -huh. and I think particularly boys until the last, you know, several decades when women now are, are uh, uh, clergy as well. But there, there's a, just a, a classic profile for uh, ministers, uh, and, you, and you fit and, it, David. Apparently, and, well, and, I've heard well, you I mean, one of them, extremely nice or extremely bad. I'm somewhere in the middle. One of them is they they very much want to do well. I mean, they they feel. I mean, this is what I've heard mm -hmm. them say. They feel that people expect more of them because they're the son of the minister, and so uh. that just puts a a, a level of uh, pressure and expectation on them that is, you know, challenging to handle in life. You can please correct me. No, no, you're absolutely you're spot on. I mean, uh, the way I jokingly say this, everyone in the congregation knew who you were and everybody oh, was yes. watching you. And, aye, aye, aye. Thank That's you. a lot. And, and again, a lot. And, and the other thing is, of course, there is what people perceive the minister is, but you, of course, see the minister on a day-to-day -day basis and you realize they're human. Yeah. Um, and so, no, I celebrate that my parents early on said, if you have talents then you have a responsibility to make sure your talents help others. 
And so this gets back to what Carmen was saying about the expectations was both my younger sister and I, that was something that was placed on us. I actually celebrated, but they also, they did give freedom for us to figure out whatever we wanted to be. And I actually got the same birthday card, not, not in a row, but I've gotten the same birthday card three different times, which is this kid with a shower and a sprinkler on his head, like he's pointing it upwards. And it says, son, we never met, quite knew what you were doing, but we're proud of you all the same. And so I think, <laughs> you know, um, but I guess- What part of the country did you grow up in? I, I grew or, up in or... Tidewater, Virginia. So he was in oh, the Virginia okay. conference. And, and again, because, you know, different faiths move you around different times, his skill set was healing fragmented congregations and capital planning. He would inherit a church that for whatever new reason needed some healing. You had to be active. Um, and you had to be cautious because, as you know, sometimes when you try to help a fragmented group of people, a fragment, and you try to help them, sometimes they will turn on you and say, you're the problem, even if you just arrived. Exactly. exactly. And so that is also, and, and you also, the reality is church politics are in some respects are even more vicious than national or international politics because it's the smaller the, know, it's like, the more passionate. <laughs> we can ask ourselves the question, which is worse, church <laughs> politics or academia? Oh, there's a reason why I got my PhD and quickly deployed. I was told I was throwing my life away when I got my PhD and did postdocs and then raised my hand to go to Afghanistan. And so, yep. you know, I, yeah, I was very told by people. And I was like, there's kind of like if Rome burns around this, uh, <laughs> saying. but even in Afghanistan. Um, Can I go back to something sure. you said about Afghanistan right at the beginning that sure. I, I, I put a bookmark on it in my brain. You said that uh you didn't think it was a good well I, I you said these things adjacent to each other i don't know if you meant them causally but i got the impression that you did mm -hmm. there was only 20 percent literacy in afghanistan and we're not going to bring democracy there anytime soon it's going to take you know 30 40 50 decades years. a generation whatever so when you said that i go okay so that's interesting that there's this link that you are seem to be making between literacy level of education i'm not sure literacy is a word that could mean many things in that context level of education sophistication cognitive style whatever and democracy and so i i would like you to say a little bit more about sure. how you think about those two because it, it you know caught, caught my attention yeah yeah happy to so this was right after I had finished postdocs at MIT and Harvard. Uh, my wife and I moved up to DC. I was working for the Institute for Defense Analyses. And if you remember when the presidents changed from Bush 43 to President Obama, they, 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 they kept in place Secretary of Defense Gates. And so there, a call went out um, saying we want a nonpartisan to go downrange uh, to identify problems we don't know are problems yet impossible fixes. And so I raised my hand um, and and Sure thing I knew, two days after inauguration, I was on a C-130 bound for um, going downrange to Afghanistan. I could talk to anybody. Got to grow a beard, didn't have to wear a uniform, go outside the wire. And, and about 45 days in, after talking to you know, US forces, NATO forces, coalition forces, local people on the ground, um, I kept on asking people, again, sort of the same thing I did at the FCC, why are we still here? And nobody could give me a reason. The, the closest they could say is we're here to bring legitimacy to the Afghan government. And I'm like, well, that's an outcome, not a reason. Because um, if that's the case, why aren't we in Yemen? Uh, you know, there's other places in the world we should be. And then two, um, I was like, so, well, how are we going to bring that legitimacy? And you're like, well, it's going to be, it's going to be perceived as a democracy. And I was like, really? Sure. Um, you know, at the same time, we're saying we're leaving in one or two years. One of these two things is got to give. You're either going to have to commit to being there for 30 or 40, 50 years, or you're going to have to recognize that you're not going to bring democracy in the short term, partly because, again, with, with that low of a literacy rate, disinformation was rampant. Um, you know, there had been, sadly, at least one case, if not multiple cases, where um, the Taliban had detonated propane tanks and claimed it was a U.S. missile strike. And, and with, you know, and again, the, the thing that the U.S. would do is we'd come out and say, we're investigating, which was true. And then three or four weeks later, we'd come back and say, here's what really happened. But to your point earlier about Julia, about the, the loops in that the, the time horizons were too small. Yeah. The other thing that we also had was we were paying people if, if one of their family members had unfortunately been killed by us. So of course they were, but they got no payment if it was killed by the Taliban. So of course, everybody was motivated to say it was a Taliban. It was not Taliban. It was the US that had killed them. And so there was so many perverse incentives here. 
Um, and, and at the end of the day, when I went up to the balcony and said, what's really going on here? Because I'm like, how do we, how do we, you know, it's 2009, how do we not exit? Um, part of it was also, I hate to say, it, incentives for promotions it, within the U.S. system that you didn't get promoted to say we should leave. And so, again, I didn't want to admire the problem, but that was a data point to point to literacy and say, you've got to decide what are you doing? Are you there for 30 or 40 years? Or are you there to try and recognize that education is necessary, that there has to be institutions in place, that democracy does not come magically out of the, you know, the Arab Springs, another example. It does not magically show up on the scene. And so, um, but then I also gave solutions because you never bring problems to the general. You have to also bring solutions. And the two options I gave was one, pull uniform troops out, you know, find some small victory and let special forces go to the 13 different tribes offering aid on an annual basis, um, saying contingent upon you receiving this aid, you agree not to abide a tribe that means harm to us, the West. But if you didn't want to do that, then the other thing would be um, invite the UN to play a peacekeeping role um, and recognize that the UN could be made of both Indian forces from the country of India, as well as uh, China, BRC. Uh, and China does share a border. In fact, we were probably protecting some of their copper mines. And Indian culture is much more like Pashtun culture than Pakistani. Um, but that's where I ran headlong into the surge is going to work. And I'm like, I'm not sure the surge is working in Iraq, not to mention Afghanistan is four times the size, the most mountainous frame on the face of the planet. But sometimes, you know, you bring you bring what data you can to bear. And at the end of the day, part of the leadership is the willingness to say, okay, I've done my part. Uh, but that was 2009. And so when I came back from that, that's why I needed a sounding board. Because I partly just wanted to hear what other people's views were on that issue. So... Yeah, um, Carmen just I, I, I don't think in oh, that discussion that you actually, huh? I don't you think you just froze for a second, you, but you're back. Oh, okay. I don't think that in that discussion that you actually articulated how you see this connection between literacy and democracy. And I, I, you know, I, I, on the one hand, I can see how that could be the case. You talked, you know, 20% literacy, there's a lot of disinformation. Well, there's a lot of disinformation with 100% literacy. So right. that, we can't isolate that factor, right? So I, uh, you know, my bias, because I, you know, my grandmother only had a first grade education and she was, you know, probably the most beloved person in my life. My bias is that you don't have to be literate or you don't have to be educated in a sophisticated way to understand the concept of democracy. So I believe there's something else going on there. Could be. So let me unpack it a little bit more. Um, in, a, in a realm in which the interpretations of the Quran are dependent on the mullahs because you can't read it for yourself, then you are dependent on what the mullahs are telling you is and isn't appropriate and you have no way to fact check for yourself mm -hmm. and the more moderate mullahs of course receive threats and death threats saying you know we may not get you now but at some point in time the u.s is going to leave they told them they're going to leave and so if you pick the side of the u.s in your interpretation you know your family you know vengeance is eternal and so it was trying to unpack the fact that when you are when you are not able to independently triangulate what someone is telling you is or isn't the case then you are dependent on their interpretations. And so if you have benevolent individuals, sure, you don't need it. But if you have to do it yourself, it can be exploited. And one of the things I kind of lament, and I say this both half jokingly and half serious, is I feel like the last 15 years, the US has become more like Afghanistan the other way around. We've become more tribal. As you said, disinformation is rampant and we have actual literacy here. And so it's people not going to take the time to the actual sources and reading it for themselves and saying, no, they actually didn't say that, or that's not the whole thing. I mean, I remind people that that most disinformation is effective when it does two out of three things. When courts, they tell you to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Most disinformation does two out of the three, and then it gets loosey-goosey right. on the third thing. And so it was, it was just that we, if we were going to bring reason to why we were there and reason to what we were doing, as opposed to just fighting an all-out war, um, I did not see the conditions present in which uh, the interpretations would be more of a moderate interpretation versus extremism. And I think we've become, and, and again, I think the U.S. has become more like Afghanistan, to your point, and yet we still can read. We're just not taking the time to see the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Well, and we're choosing our mullahs. 
<laughs> or yeah, or metaphorical. And okay, I'll give another example on leadership in which this was a case where I didn't initially succeed, but at the end of the day, I think it was one of those, whether you want to call it a no win situation or Kobayashi Maru, if you're a Star Trek fan situations. Um, so at the FCC, after four years, we, we succeeded in moving everything to public cloud and private hosting and, and addressing, we couldn't say at the time, the APTs that had been present, but that's partly why we moved to cloud and because we couldn't trust the infrastructure we had. So but just for the rest of the audience, APT means what? Advanced persistent threats. In other words, a very sophisticated threat that is more than your, it is something that's probably associated with the state actor. And this was prior to my arrival. So that's partly why I moved to cloud was, again, hosting everything on premise. I actually had spent the first six months trying to actually talk to the Department of Defense saying, can you host the FCC or can you host a firewall? Lawyers had a field day with that saying, well, that's, you know, not sure the, the the an independent regulatory agency can be protected by the Department of Defense, and so we're on our own. And so that's why we moved to the public cloud was not that public cloud is going to be perfect, but for a small agency, how do I actually, you know, sort of defend these assets? And so we moved, and then in 2017, we had a high-profile proceeding involving net neutrality. And we'd had one before back in 2014 as well, where just to give the audience a sort of basis, usually... Public commenting. Public commenting is when agencies are open to legal concerns that they need to consider and address. And it's legal concerns, not just opinions. Usually agencies receive, you know, no more than 1% of agencies receive more than 10,000 comments. So in 2014, the FCC got 2.3 million comments with 1.2 million in the last week of 120 day commenting period. Do I think they're all human? questionable, especially because I'd asked to use CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA is a way you detect bots. And they said, no, you can't use CAPTCHA because if someone can't see and can't hear, they may not be able to file. You need to be open to everyone to file. I asked the lawyers, could I use reCAPTCHA, which is a more invisible way to detect bots? And they said, no, that might be interpreted as surveillance by the government. We can't do that. I said, could I block spam? And they said, well, define spam. I said, a single IP address filing a comment 100 times a minute. Probably not human. And they said, nope, because one of the 100 comments might be real. I was like, this is going to be fun. And so that was 2014. We had people uploading War and Peace every day. We had people uploading their washer and dryer manual and their math homework. I'm not sure if that was a pro or con vote, but we had to receive everything. Fast forward to 2017, we fortunately moved to the cloud, uh, but we again cautioned and said, you know, there may be some shenanigans that, that get done and can we use CAPTCHA? Nope, can't block spam either. Okay, this is going to be fun. And so at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., which I think most people in the United States are probably sleeping. I know they're passionate about this issue. We were seeing volumes of 6,000 comments a minute. <laughs> and again, I don't know if they're all human. I don't know if I need deep forensics. We had to spin up more than 3,000 time our cloud capacity to handle it. Um, and I was friends with Vint Cerf and he had actually, we had actually played this out. I was like, what am I gonna do since I basically can only just, I have to sort of drink from the fire hose. And so we had talked about it and the chairman's office said, is this a denial service? And uh, Vin and I had talked about it, Vint Cerf having helped set up TCP IP and helped create the internet. We agreed that it was not at the network layer, but we did say at the application layer, effectively it's crowding out the application, tying it up so that it's harder for humans to respond. It's just slightly delayed. We still were up 99.5% of the time. David, David, let me find out where are you, where are you headed on this story? Cause I'm lost in the-, in the... Stay tuned, I'm about to get to the punchline. <laughs> okay. so, so we came out and said, yes. Um, and so what happened was uh, we didn't know that both sides of the aisle might have been involved in the bot generation and bot submission of these comments. Because immediately they said, where's your proof? And I said, patterns of life. Well, that's not forensics. Don't think I need forensics. I mean, 6,000 comments a minute at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., kind of weird, especially since less than 1% of agencies get 10,000 comments. We actually got 23 million comments, so 10x from what, three years ago. But people are like, oh, no, 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 you know. And so moved on, worked with Vent Surf at the People's Center Internet Coalition and behind the scenes also with special operations on tackling disinformation. It wasn't until 2021 that the New York Attorney General concluded of the 23 million comments we got, 18 million were bot generated and bot submitted, 9 million from one side of the aisle, 9 million from the other side of the aisle. Wow, oh, so, so nice, fair and balanced. Well, <laughs> the difference was one side of the aisle hired six companies, which was questionable about whether you could pay companies to do this. The other side of the aisle and engaged one or more volunteers to do the same thing. But it points to, and that was 2017, 
that was before generative AI. I mean, you still had rudimentary bots that could change the sentences and change the words, but we're now in an era in which with generative AI, you know, how, you know, heaven forbid, not only would you get 23 million comments, but instead of 23 million comments with five lines each, you got well, 20 comments with 10,000 pages that you have to wade through. It feels to me that this, that this argues for Carmen's point, which is that literacy may be our downfall. <laughs> well, <laughs> the fact that you're supposed to read all the comments, and right? I mean, so it's almost like it has come full circle. So there's, I mean, so when you were talking about the elites, right, holding the flag, that's got to be where the word elitism comes from too, right? And so, and so the elitists, the one in front with the flag, um, signaling where to go, it does feel like eventually they march around the earth and they're behind. I mean, it does, it does feel like that's where we have to be careful with leadership sure. is, is getting so far ahead that we are trailing. Well, and and I, think I think we might be doing that with words. True. And I would say, and you, you just thought, I think it was more later the leap went to hoplites, hoplites. And so that was more the derivation, not elite. And I, I'm oh. not a, a, a English major. So I don't I know either. Just reminded me of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, but I'm, I'm the not an elite is, grammatician. Um, well, and so one of the things that I had seen both when the bioterrorism program happened and, and what motivated to get my PhD was how minority perspectives are shut down when when people are trying to make sense of what's going on. Um, and you can think about the NASA Challenger accident, for example. There were a few engineers that said, I'm not sure we should launch because these are colder temperatures and everything like that, and they got shut down. Mm -hmm. And so I think, again, going back to Carmen's view of it's creating that space in which a, 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 a weak signal can be communicated and be heard and be considered and the challenge is, is how do you discern the weak signal that actually has merits versus the interesting idea, but there's actually no data there. But I agree with you that you don't want to shut down the weak signals. No, and question. But creating, creating is too strong a verb there. Yeah. Okay. It's very, it, you can't create the space. You can grow the space. Uh, you can nurture. You can nurture the space, but you don't, you definitely, for my, you know, taste, the you want a, a term that is as sort of unmechanical and uninstrumental as yeah. possible. But yeah, it's the yin yang. That's that's the crazy place I've ended up in, and that's perfectly fine. And I would say I, I'll give a. I mean, wait, I, wait, I David, before you before you do, I'm going to short circuit this because I have this burning question that okay. I think would be really interesting, which is, can you give an example of a time in which you wish that you had heard a weak signal as a leader? but that you didn't and you look back later and you're like hmm i didn't hear that hmm, good question um i mean i think it happens <laughs> it happens every day to be candid um and and so oftentimes it's whether or not you are able to later see that the environment was enforcing that but i think that happens every day and, and if anything you know, <laughs> my wife has also observed, she says, you ruminate a lot on past decisions. And I'm like, well, that's partly because I want to reflect to see, was I attentive in the moment? And how do I know I was attentive in the moment? Because you're taking in so many inputs and you're trying to make sense. Um, but yes, I, I would say um, without giving details, uh, I've been quietly working behind the scenes on a space company and trying to help bring it out of receivership. And there were some weak signals that possibly one of the investors probably wasn't the right investor. Um, but at the time, I didn't hear that signal until later it was proven. But yes, I would give that. Um, I will I will say with love to Carmen's part about creating. I, I once challenged my father um, because my rebellion when I went off to middle school and high school and then college was to go into science, whereas he was a minister. Um, I said, you know, it, 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 are weddings just a way of the church reminding you who's in charge? Because who's talking? It's the minister, not the couple for the most part, and who's up, you know, and everything like that. And and he said it might be for some churches. It might be some people use that just to remind you about authority and power. But he says that he saw, and again, I get your point about creative being mechanical. He says it's about creating a space because at some time that couple is going to have arguments, disagreements, something in which they need something larger than themselves to call upon. And so there's a wonderful book. It's by the same person, I'm blanking on his name, that did everything I need to know I already learned in kindergarten. He also does on ceremonies. And he says that 
through the rituals and patterns of ceremonies, we can, and he does use the word create, we can create things that people then can call upon when they need a force stronger than themselves to get through whatever they're weathering. And so when I'm talking about creation, it's really the idea that it's not reminding authority, it's not reminding power, it's about something that when you're trying to get through that really hard time together that you can call upon and remember. Strengthening a rope by weaving it through time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's cool. Preach. Very cool. I can accept that. Yes. And that's actually, I mean, because I, 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 my wife went into a lope when we got married. And and so, because she, she was kind of recovering from organized religion to a bit. And, uh, um, but in the end, we, we did do a ceremony. We wrote our own vows. Um, but uh, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yes. Wow. Well, this has been, I've really enjoyed, this has been eye-opening and kind of cool, heart-opening, in fact. Well, I appreciate it. And it's great to see both of you, Carmen. I mean, again, I, I'm always impressed with what you're doing. Uh, thank you for it. And Julia, of course, um, we continue to have fun together. So, Sounds yeah. great. And I wish you a wonderful summer. You as too. And good uh, travels. Memorial and Day trip. weekend. Yeah, that's right. Then a week from today is Memorial Day. Yep. Ah, fantastic. Bye, Panda people. Bye, David. Bye, Carmen. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.